Welcome back. Former President Donald Trump has been indicted again. These latest charges accuse him, along with 18 allies, of a criminal conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election results in Georgia. Trump faces 13 felony counts, including violating Georgia's RICO Act, a racketeering law usually brought against organized crime operations. The other 18 people charged include Trump's former attorney, Rudy Giuliani, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, and Sidney Powell, a conservative lawyer who pushed claims of voter fraud. The Fulton County District Attorney has given the 19 defendants until next Friday, August 25th, to turn themselves in. Here to help us break down these latest charges are white-collar defense attorney George Danini and former federal prosecutor Rick Convertino, who now works as a defense attorney. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Rick, I'll start with you. Okay. You've been here before talking about previous indictments. Uh, help us break down exactly what is the former president and his allies accused of in this case, and how does it differ from the other election interference case that we learned about a couple weeks ago? Well, the one a couple weeks ago overlaps a lot of the a lot of the overt acts and the crimes that are included in the RICO case. The difference is this is a RICO or Racketeering Influenced Corrupt Organization Act charge. It's the first time that, that this charge has been has been levied on the president and others. It includes 19 other co-defendants and uh, 160 overt acts. And an overt act is an act that's done in furtherance of the conspiracy. An overt act doesn't have to necessarily be a criminal act, just an act that's done in furtherance or to assist in the completion of the conspiracy. There are 160 of those. There's also uh, 41 predicate acts, which are crimes included under the RICO statute, there's, there's specific crimes that are allowed under the umbrella of RICO that are charged as predicate acts, and two of those have to be uh, committed to be a pattern of racketeering, which would include the penumbra of racketeering influence corrupt organization. So it gives the prosecutor a huge girth to go out and collect evidence and then use the evidence. The evidence against the enterprise comes in not necessarily against if it were a single co-defendant. So it's a much broader uh, charge. George, are these the most serious charges against the former president um, in your mind from what you've seen from all four indictments? Well, look, RICO ratchets things up, and we can talk about that a little bit if you want. I would say a federal indictment is going to be a bigger case against somebody than a local district attorney indictment. This has expansive language. Again, RICO is, I like to think of it just to kind of make it more simplistic as a conspiracy kind of on steroids. Um, but I think the district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, chose to charge that offense because her jurisdiction is very limited. And if you read this document, she's pulled in conduct that occurred in multiple states, seven states and the District of Columbia, and typically, a local district attorney is not going to be able to bring all those events in. It's really localized at, the, at that level. But by charging this offense in this manner, she can bring out the full picture and try to bring that in just within the state and which, within that county. So tell us more about what RICO is. And this uh, prosecutor, Fannie Willis herself, she has used this a number of times in the past, hasn't she? I think nine times in the past. Uh, in the short time she's been in office, two and a half years. It's a, it's a very, very heavy tool for a prosecutor to use because it allows... So uh, it, just as an example, I, I recently had a RICO case that involved a motorcycle club. And the evidence that came in about the club was the culture of the club, the way the club acted, the way the club uh, conducted their, their daily activities and their, their, their yearly activities. Um, so it gave a broad picture of the, of the club as a whole and all the criminality that occurred. And so if there were, it's like spokes on a wheel. If you had one member of a club in Alabama and another member of the club in Port Huron, not necessarily knowing what either one of them is doing, but the, they all are included in the RICO conspiracy because they're part of the enterprise. And so they, you can be convicted of a murder that, in, that occurred in Arizona if you're a club member in Port Huron and had no knowledge about the, the murder in Arizona at all if it's a part of the ongoing racketeering Influence Corrupt Organization Act and part of what the enterprise does. So it's a huge tool for a prosecutor to bring in evidence that they otherwise wouldn't be able to bring in. George, Trump's legal team said this is shocking and absurd in a statement. If you were defending Trump in this situation, what is your potential out here? 
Well, I think the potential out is you got to defend the case. Um, you're going to have to muster up your arguments to say what the allegations in here are not what actually happened. He's going to have to say that he was, for example, entitled to contest the results of the Georgia election. He did exactly that. And Which he, we heard him say. And he, he, you know, he implemented a strategy to achieve his objective. The question that the jury will have to decide is, were his, were his, was the plan or was the strategy in violation of the law or was it in compliance with the law? And that'll be up to the jury to decide. And the prosecution on the other, George is right, and from the, the, the upper side of that is the prosecution will show that over and over and over again, he was told and had full knowledge and was aware that he lost the election, fair and simple, and that he had, he had in Georgia, there were three additional counts complete counts in which Biden was the elected official, uh, president. Uh, he, Trump himself, hired uh, two individual in, independent law, uh, firms to go out and investigate. Both of those came back and said that Biden had won. Um, he had been told by multiple people, including people in the indictment as uh, unindicted and indicted co-conspirators. So he had a full plethora of knowledge and, and a, a agglutination of the facts that, that were brought to him and he still continued to go on and try and, um, and try and have this election turned. With the federal indictment that came down a couple of weeks ago related to those alleged efforts to overturn the election, uh, the former president was the only defendant named. Very different situation from this case in Georgia. Uh, we've also heard that federal case is likely to be prosecuted quickly, They're, that the special counsel is trying to get that moving. How might this case different, differ with so many defendants? Yeah, it's a great question. So it really does cover the same set of facts. Uh, obviously, the 2020 election. Um, the Georgia case is much broader in the sense of 19 defendants in total and 30 uh, unindicted co-conspirators that are identified in that indictment, whereas the federal indictment is just against the former president, um, although there were six unindicted co-conspirators mentioned in the federal case. That case came first. Whether it will go first, whether it will take precedence, you know, is, remains to be seen. But when you have two cases like this, and it's very strange, frankly, for that to happen, uh, where a federal case and a state case are going at the same time, involving the same set of witnesses, I mean, they're going to be jockeying for who's going to show up to, you know, which trial mm -hmm. when. Uh, obviously, the dates and the timeline will, will play itself out. And again, don't forget, there's two other indictments that have nothing to do with these in New York, and then the other federal indictment on the document destruct or um, you know collection issue or uh, possession issue. Mm -hmm. um, so those will we'll have to see which one of these comes first. We're running out of time. Let me get your final thoughts here. How likely do you think a conviction is in this case? Oh man, geez, uh, I think it's I think it's extraordinarily likely that there will be convictions in this case. Uh, there's 19 people charged, but I did, I did want to make a quick point. The difference between the 19 charged in this case and, and Trump charged singularly is a Bruton issue, and it's, a, it's going to be a huge issue in this second trial with 19 co-defendants, and that issue is co-defendants who give statements against other co-defendants cannot, that, those statements have to be analyzed by the judge, they have to be excised because there's a hearsay problem and it's a constitutional due process problem, so if Co-defendant number one makes a statement against co-defendant number two. Neither one testifies. That statement has, it's a, it's a real issue. It's a real legal battle about getting that statement in because you can't, co-defendant co number two can't cross-examine co-defendant number one. So that's a huge difference. And that, that's why I think Jack Smith indicted only singularly President Trump, former President Trump because they won't have that issue, which will be an abundance of difficulty in, the sec in, this new, in this new indictment. It is going to be a busy year for the former president and for the news media and analysts here, mm -hmm. of course. I'm sure we will have you both back to break this all down. Uh, George Danini and Rick Convertino, thanks, thanks so much for joining us today.